Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim G.K. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim G.K. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Again, welcome to another episode of, of the Core Business Show. Today, I have a great guest, Dr. Gene Carter from Hope, Inc. in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, if you have any questions, I invite you to call in at 347-324-3460. Again, that number is 347-324-3460. Or you can pose a question in the chat room, and I'll go ahead and read the, the question on the air. Also, if you do call in, if you do have a question, just Press the number one, and that indicates that you have your hand up, and I know you have a question, I'll put you right on the air. Again, this show can be downloaded at the very end on iTunes or Blog Talk Radio. Dr. Carter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Great. I did a session at the Potter's House a few weeks ago, and ironically, I was telling you just before we went on the air that I was talking to them about this best ran organization in Wichita, Kansas. And I just said, well, I thought about it. I just had to hear her story about her entire organization. So whatever you did when I was in college and friends almost 20 years ago made a, such an impact. It came out into a session at the Pilot's House. So anyway, let's begin with, uh, let's talk about you in general and then talk about your organization as a whole. Well, first of all, uh, I'm the founder, CEO, and president of Hope Incorporated. It's a 36-year-old Kansas nonprofit corporation. Of course, I'm an African female, and my dreams uh, have been revealed and filled, and they're still flourishing. And um, my compassion was affordable housing and prison initiative reentry. And um, I seamlessly and diligently uh, managed and placed forth efforts successfully to eliminate the stressed properties that was donated to us. There was so much drugs, crimes, prostitution, and unsafe living in the particular areas uh, for the past 13 years. Uh And I wanted to see something done that not only could beautify our areas, but clean it up and give our young people, young adults, something to look forward to in their communities. And I wanted to look as though that I would be uh, happy to live in. Wow. Wow. So that was some of the that was the very beginning. It was a dream and within that we were already doing uh social services. So we were trying to utilize the other networks that we had resources in the city like the food banks and so forth. It was a blessing because it gave an, an avenue for a glue stick relationship. So when we did have the opportunity to have the apartments donated to us by two prominent individuals here in the city after reviewing on television the things that we were doing. All of those came into being, so we meshed together. So we were able not only to furnish shelter, but we were able as well to furnish services to our tenants, and that spread it throughout the community. One of the dreams that I really was in awe to fulfill, and that was our community correct. I went to a workshop in San Francisco, and it had not been done here in Kansas, neither in Wichita, and I presented that. So I was able to initiate the community corrections here in Wichita, Kansas. Wow. So spread it so I providing housing, jobs, and I'm happy to say that A men's warehouse uh, in Texas utilizes us for a sewer drive every year. So not only are we able to do the resumes for those individuals that are reentering into the society, but we're able to clothe them for church and for job interviews. We do the resumes. So our housing consists of more than just housing, more than just shelter. Mm -hmm. Wow. So just going back these many moons ago, in the history, how did you have this passion in your heart to start this organization? 
Just and growing up, my, my father being a minister and then uh, passing away a few years ago was Bishop James Jones. Mm-hmm. And the church, he always, I, I tell you, there were just individuals coming in there like you would take in cats and dogs. There was people coming in there for clothing and for food, and he always had a plenty in order to supply them. So I wanted to carry on that mission, and because that's what I grew up under that kind of leadership, working in the community and being a community advocate. So I really inherited that from my dad and from the Christian uh, walk in my life that I was taught. And within that, it was a beautiful because within my workshops and seminars and my connections, I was invited to go to uh, Beijing, China, to initiate the same type of program like we have here. And, in fact, I was also invited by the National Minority AIDS Council, USAID, and ASAID of South Africa uh, to teach and enhance management and administrative or programmatic capacities of CBOs and non-government organizations. So I was very happy uh, to have that invite. However, we were right in the process of trying to get our tax credits and so forth and get our our apartments rehab so that they could be habitable, and so I was not able to accept either of the invitations. Wow. Out of 10, I was asked. Wow, at least that's an opportunity in the future. When you went on the air, was it just out of a fluke, or is it something that someone said, hey, why don't you just contact the TV station? How did you approach that? You just wrote the news editor and asked them to take a look at your story and your mission? No, I did because I'm really not a television person. I'm, I'm a person that works behind the scenes real well. I'm not one to be out front. Mm-hmm. And because of our networking, when we just had social services and not the housing, the word got around very quickly. And, you know, your rep goes before you wherever. And so within that, individuals that had the opportunity and the resources to connect to Hope Incorporated Olive Ann Beach was the first individual that did ten thousand dollars for the cause, and uh, and it just mushrooms from there. And if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it, it's good. Someone has a contact with the with the media, and so that's what happened. It just flourished from there, and wow. from then on, we've been receiving donations. And like I say, the uh, men's warehouse out of Texas. It's one that provides all of our suits and shirts and ties for our men. And it's just a blessing. Um, And we're still growing. We are getting in the process as a developer. uh, We're getting ready. um, We're in the process now of building uh, the first phase of 42-unit senior citizen complex with the community center and then another um, senior residence in Oklahoma because we are now – uh, my dream is going further than I ever thought it was. It's only God. You can't have a garage sale by yourself. Wow. But we're, we're now we are incorporated in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. So we're just going through doing God's work. Wow, that, that's an amazing story. So you're saying that the company, all of a sudden two individuals out of the city say, hey, they just gave you the apartment buildings because they like your story, they like your mission, and how did you feel about that? I mean, it's beyond well, anybody's expectation. It's important. No, it's very important to have good board of directors wow. that share your vision. Mm-hmm. And those board of directors have to come from all sectors that you're trying to serve. And there should be a real estate person, uh, a banker, someone that is noted in the community, because that's where mouthpiece comes in, and they make those contacts. Um, The other network is the resources in the city, and then once you connect with those resources and you have a networking in there, then the word just, it just mushrooms. Uh, This is what's going on, and then they will ask for help, and then they will then come in and, of course, you know, you have to give you 501c3. You have to go in and present to their committee. And then it just mushrooms from there. But it's about doing, honestly, not for money or not for self-gratification, but to go out there and do a need assessment for your community to see what is needed in the community. And then you get those individuals involved. But you must remember that it's very important 
that whenever you speak to someone about what the need is, nine times out of ten, they really, even though they live in the city, they're not aware of the need that is in their particular city until it's brought to the forefront. Then you take them on um, a tour, places that they probably would have never gone. There are some places in our northeast area that some of the individuals that have been our major donors um, have not been in the city in which they live and some wow. are leaders. So it's very important that meetings are held with those individuals that we think know what's going on and they really don't. Okay. Wow, because they don't explore the other side of the city. So you're right. right. Wow. So in your organization structure, you mentioned about having a solid board of directors or the board of advisors or a board of directors to help manage and to help organize and solidify your company, whole thing. Well, first of all, you have to have your advisors and you have your board of directors and then you have your executive board. Your okay. advisors are the ones that are really out there looking at other businesses. Where did they fail? What is needed? And then they bring those back. Previous at that time, I did that myself. Mm -hmm. see the myself. And that really helped because once my board of directors were coming aboard, I was able to instruct them and show them what my vision was that was according to connecting and mushrooming that my vision out into the community so that it could serve a purpose of those individuals, children and families, single parents. Um, so we were able to move into the arena. We developed that uh, motto, together we stand and divided we fall. And we started really um, out of Van Beach or Beach Aircraft here was the one that gave the first $10,000 for us to really reach out there and do what we needed to do. So we really worked with churches, other community-based organizations, and it just mushroomed from there because that's where the people went that had the need. Then we went to our street outreach ministry. That's where we contacted the individuals that were homeless. So for 30-plus years, this is what we have been doing, and from that, it's, uh, if they've been successful, we've had individuals that come into our housing, which is predominantly uh, our mission. We've had individuals to come into our our housing that's come in homeless that are now uh, homeowners. And wow. we've had individuals that came in from the penal institution that no one wanted anything to do with. They did not want to socialize with them, but they have been great. And so now they are, some have their own business, uh, they have purchased their own homes, and, and doing quite well. Well, wow. can you talk about the services that you offer with Hope Inc.? We have a First Link uh, housing program, and it's, it's really our new birth, birth program. That's kind of what God gave me one morning at 3 o'clock in the morning to start, and everyone needs that, and of course, I'm I'm still on the Mentoring 2 program for the institutions, and I have them writing their new birth. And the new birth is, how would you start your life over again? Because wow. this is very important for not only those errands that are returning to the society, but it's for those of us that are living in society that we can start a new birth. I know I did. And mm -hmm. I had to realize that what my purpose was in life, first of all, once realizing what my purpose was, then I had to find those individuals and I had to pray that they would that God would send me the same individuals. But in my networking and my resource, I found there was people out there that really had the same interests that I had but did not know how to put it into action. And so we came together um, and we just developed our social services, which really fit in uh, like a glove on the hand with our tenants. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and we really targeted the communities that, that were at risk and high risk and minorities and the offenders and ex-offenders and the youth and our senior citizens and the low to moderate income and the working poor and the children that abused. That was pretty much... Which we really need now is Grandma's House, mm -hmm. and that's for the uh, mothers 
you know, sometimes they get kind of tired, and I, I'm, I'm hoping this can go out where that individuals can start grandma houses mm-hmm. because parents, sing, especially single parents, I mean, they go to work, they go to church, they have to have some relaxation. So grandma's houses, don't don't leave the children in the house by themselves. Don't leave them just out on the street. To, don't just give them them noodles and, and then go off and leave them. Bring them to grandma's house. And grandma's house, they can take care of them if they're on medication. Uh, there's movies. There's church. There's learning. There, you know, it's just the entire bit. So we want to see more grandma houses as well throughout the United States. So that's one of the advantages that we have even for our tenants. We were very blessed because we were the, the first individuals that implemented the first minority bank here in Wichita that was uh, in the university bank. So there are some things that we have done in our AIDS program for our AIDS education and prevention and the children of imprisoned parents. That is so important to us because those children kind of get knocked by the side. And if we look at the news today that the mothers are hurting their children, they're not ready for it. They talk about contraceptives. But is it really contraceptives? Is it really church versus state? You know, that I could just go on in that, but that's another issue for me, too. <laughs> but but um, we have to look at the educational and employment components that we need to set up in our organization. We talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. Who is creating jobs? We're in the process now of, um, and we got the help of some individuals, to open a shoe factory because we have individuals coming out of the penal institution that are designers you would not believe. Then the furniture factory. We we're talking about our coffee house. But our mm-hmm. coffee house will be more than just a coffee house. It will also be a bakery, and we do not have a minority bakery here in the city. So this will not only will this create jobs, but it also uh, will enhance the green here in Wichita. Anywhere you can go and find a couch or a chair, you know, just thrown out there. So our, our furniture factory will be one that is would be an enhancement to Hope Incorporated. Wow, that that's that is really amazing all the work you guys do down there. Do you think coming from you're an average US city, Midwest, and I know you work well in your communities, any advice of a new people who wants to take on your life, the same pro- programs that you have in another city, any advice that you would have what they need to do to get started? First thing they need to do is pray. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. Yeah. The first thing is because you know, and I'm like this, and I believe that it works because it has worked here, and it has been a drawing pillar for other individuals. Do the feasibility study first. Okay. Once you do the feasibility study, then this will let you know: Am I really the person that we should initiate this? You never find someone that do the same thing you do. Okay. If they do the same thing you do, then nothing gets done. If everybody writes proposals, no one goes out there to implement them. So you have to have a writer, an implementer, and then you have to have one that can do the operations. Mm -hmm. So you have to find people that are in the vision, and all of this has to be done. And sometimes you can do that in five to six months. Sometimes it may take a year. Because you have to get those individuals, but you have to know where you're going and the direction you're going and the purpose you have in life in order to educate those individuals the process for implementation. Okay. You follow what I'm- I follow. You have to have a vision, and, of course, you're going to delegate as well, but not to share the same gifts. So it's just even the basic part of an organization. If you're a company, you have a marketing department that does marketing. You have another person that does operation, another person that does sales, and each one has a particular roles. And there's no use of having two salespeople if one a person who can't operate the management of the products or the sales or services, and the other person who does the marketing uh, can't sell and can't operate. So in your structure, you have to have those particular subsets in order to function. Yes, and that cause, uh, you know, that then begins unlocking the doors to opportunities. And then you can branch out. Uh, we have, like, our social services. We have our classes, uh, nutrition classes, our anger management, our AIDS classes. All of this goes into living. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about, the thing, I, don't, I don't care if it's a grocery store. You do your feasibility on a grocery store. 
Mm-hmm. And you people say, well, the old saying is, well, that's a duplication of service. We have to realize, is it a duplication of services? But the services that are there, are they accessible? It may be a duplication of service, but is it accessible to everyone? Wow. Well, possible, but uh, it, they have to be accessible. We have a bus line. It cuts down at 6 o'clock. So those people that work, you know, second and third shift, how are they getting to work? Is that something you want to do in a feasibility study to talk about enhancing and creating a transportation service? So there are things that you can expand just from the needs of a, that you find in your community just doing a feasibility study. But you have to know what to look for. Wow. So how would a person do it? Uh, is there a booklet that they can get a, a feasibility study, or what's the best approach for them to say, okay, how can I do this feasible? Where shall I go to get this study done? You know, I started writing a book on feasibilities, but what I did was I then started the book on how to write a successful grant and proposal, and that includes what you do in a feasibility study because eventually you're going to have to do that. Let me show you the reasons why. It's because all over the United States they have the ability for tax credits. Mm -hmm. We took advantage of the tax credits, but you have to know how to write the proposal. You have to know how to do the feasibility study. You have to know how to do the needs assessment. Those things you have in order. So that all is in my book of how to write a successful proposal. Because we had to do that, you have to know development, you have to know how to do a cost assessment, you have to know how to do a budget. All of these things are very important. Then you have to sell those individuals because when you send in that proposal, you have to write pretty much the geographic of the area that you want to target Uh and your particular city because that has to be written in. We had to do, I had to do all of that and write that proposal in order to go in for tax credits. Then we were, then you have to then sell an investor. Right now is a good time for investors. They are going back to where, now how long this is going to take uh, and be in effect, I don't know. I know probably for the next two years that it's a good investment uh, tool is to locate the investor and that investor then gives you a commitment, and you send that in with your tax credit. This is good for, for stores. It's good for building uh, apartments. It's good for building housing uh, for first-time homeowners. It's so much things out there that it's available that we can take care of the needs of our cities that if we don't know how to do it, well, then, um, then it just lays dormant and it doesn't get done. And that's one reason you would have this advisory people to help you let you know what these credits and these services offer and how to get things done. Right, right. But if That's you don't know, you can't teach your coworkers and your board of directors. And it gets overwhelming to try to find out every single thing and to operate and to talk to people. It's just who, That's why you want to have that all together with an advisory well, board. That is probably one of the reasons why you need to have people to function into certain positions. You may have a person... To start off with, it was my dad and the ministers here, Reverend C.J. Taylor and uh, Reverend Wade, uh, Tommy Lee Wade. Those individuals came in, and I used and uh, I took from them also one of the business individuals here in the city and a banker. And we just sat down in a meeting, and I said, this is the vision, this is what I want to Okay, and this is the way that I know that I can proceed. Do you have a contact? That's the very first stage wow. of getting in there, people knowing people mm-hmm. and having that meeting. And you'd be surprised here at the office here down at the other end. My husband is from Haiti, and you'd be surprised at what a dinner meal will bring to the table, a wow. good dinner meal will bring to the table, a home-cooked dinner meal will bring to the a table. A home-cooked dinner meal. Wow. A home-cooked dinner meal. Because you can eat and they can enjoy it and you can explain and they can feel they can feel relaxed in a professional business atmosphere and you can make sure that all of your documentation is correct and right on time. So if and don't you believe that they won't check behind you because they will. And you have to have your document uh, documentation, right? Just document, document, document. So when you make your presentations you'll know exactly what you're talking about and wow. it will be actual facts. Not just guess what 
could happen or what might happen. Then you show the solution. It's pretty much like the um, the theses and the like theses and the syntheses, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's it's much in that order. But uh, you just have to give the actual facts and the documentation. Wow, that's that's you're an awesome businesswoman. <laughs> wow. I en- because this is my purpose, I enjoy it. And the other thing is, is to be in leadership, uh, you have to be open because individuals will bring you some information. And I never tell staff, I am, don't call me boss. I am either Jean or or Miss Jean or, you know, a lot of people call me Miss Hope. But uh <laughs> all work together. We all have something in here, and I tell them all, you are a part of this. You know, I, I was marketing director for a beach aircraft for a little while until I had my my fourth back surgery. And I just remember uh, one day, and this is something we all should take in matter, um, the the custodians were saying, I get so tired, Miss Jean, of them leaving their paper clips, the secretaries in the in the clerical pool, leave their, the little paper stuff all down the floor. We have to pick that up sometime, and, and paper clips and the vacuum sweepers don't pick it up. I said, let me tell you something. Let's try this. For well, one day, your maintenance. Now, this is how important everybody in the business is. I said, for one day, when you come in, I said, it's summertime, right? I said, don't turn on the air conditioner, don't clean up, and don't empty the trash just for one day. They came in, they were so, they said, Miss Jean, where's maintenance? Where's maintenance? I said, "Uh, you're concerned about maintenance? You don't invite them into when you have your luncheons. You don't invite them uh, when you have your little teas and your breaks and so forth. You don't show them appreciation, but yet and still you want to know where maintenance is? And from that point on, they respect it. So it's it's the man that you think at the bottom of the totem pole is the one that makes it grow. Wow. Boeing can have all of the administrators that they want, but if they don't have the machinists and if they don't have the individuals, it's no need for them to have a job. The planes don't get produced. Wow. So that's the kind of the same way that I look at my staff uh, that I work with. And I tell them that we're all in this together. We can't have a garage sale by ourselves. And so you have to keep that up. That gives them a willingness to work. It gives them an, a feeling that they're a part of the organization, not just there taking orders and doing work. Anybody can go work. Mm-hmm. But you want to feel a part of what you're building. Wow. That, that's really awesome. How did you come up with the name HOPE, and what does it stand for? Well, you know, I was working as the first female black secretary in membership at the First United Methodist Church. It's one of the largest uh, Methodist churches here in uh, Wichita. Uh-huh. And we had uh, a minister that came in, Dr. Lawrence Landrum from Houston, Texas, and he became the senior minister of the First United Methodist Church. And when he came in, he was hiring all new office staff, and I happened to be the only black female or female of color, period, that had interviewed for the position. At that time, it was good to have shorthand typing, bookkeeping, and the whole bit. <laughs> and um, so I had it all. And I I looked around and I said, well, I'm wondering if I'm even going to get an interview. And immediately my spirit said, you got the interview and you got the job. And I just said, well, thank you, Lord. Wow. <laughs> and they all looked at me. So when I went in there, Dr. Landrum, he asked me if I could. He dictated a letter to me and asked me if I would go out and get it ready for his signature. And I did, and it was like less than five minutes. And um, I always had good clerical skills anyway in the operation of office equipment, so that was a plus. Because of my education, my dad pressed that. He stressed that, and he pressed that. And so when I he he took the letter, signed it, and he said, it's ready to go in the mail. And I said, well, thank you. He said, when can you start work? And I, I looked at him, and he said, go out there and um, have my clerk to have you to fill out a W-2. Well, there were still ladies out there that need to be interviewed, and so he just told her to tell them that the interviews were cut for today and that he would notify them if he should need them to come back in. And I got the job there. Then the ideas were then really popping. He said, what can I do in this city 
that I can bring to this city that would be different, that would bring people together. And, of course, Martin KEB, one of the largest construction companies in Olivan Beach, Beach Aircraft Company, those were the individuals that had their membership there at that um, at First United Methodist Church. So within that, I was called in to take notes at their at their business meeting. And then uh, Dr. Landrum looked over at me. He said, well, Jen, you're just riding away. He said, uh, do you have any input? And I said, well, first of all, let's, we could have an international tea. That's what started having our international tea. We thought that was a lot of money because we raised $1,500 with that international tea. We had tables set up with all the different people from that. It was a good relationship uh, that we started building. And uh, he said, well, what else can you do? I said, well, let's have these individuals to join an organization. He said, well, what would you call the organization? That's what Olive Van Beach asked me. And I said, hope, because we all need hope. And she said, well, why? And I said, she said, well, it's just hope. And I said, well, those will be acronyms. It's going to be helping our people economically. And so that's what hope stands for, helping our people economically. So we started the first free university. If you knew how to grow corn, someone knew how to grow tomatoes, we exchanged that. If you knew how to do math and someone knew how to do social studies or whatever, that was an exchange. It was really a t- tutorial type of university set letting. And since then, we have WSU and French University. In fact, we have uh, social work students that come in now. Uh, in fact, we have some in the building today that are doing their um their practicum, then we have interns that come in and do the internship, and they utilize and work with our tenants. So it's about how we got started. We got started because someone said, what can I do to make this place better? And I give all that to Dr. Lawrence Landrum, which was killed in a plane crash, he and his wife, Betty Landrum. And then there was uh, the couple that owned Askins Credit Clothing here, and it was done just before they had the accident an accident and killed off for him just before Easter. Wow! And, uh, uh, it's been nineteen in the seventies. So it's it's uh, it's amazing the history of how we got started. We were just doing social services then. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any housing. The housing came later. But all of these things and going in and you have to start somewhere. But you have to know your purpose. You have to know exactly the need. And you have to know how to pull people together, and everyone does not know how to do that. Okay. You mentioned, uh, I think, Olivan Beach. So she was part of Beach Aircraft, or? Yeah, she was, uh, well, she married uh, Walter Beach, and she was his secretary, and she married him. But they belonged to the First United Methodist Church. Oh, wow. And, okay. And so that was my connection there, and she gave the first $10,000 for Hope Incorporated. And we were there in the church for a while until we uh, branched out. And then after the death and so forth, um, we are we were under the auspices of the First United Methodist Church. If you go to the Wichita Library, we're still listed by them, but we are a separate entity. But that was our birthplace. Okay. And uh, in operating a uh, 501c3, uh, your paperwork, I think when you – did this some years later. How difficult was it, since you already was an established business, was it really difficult to fill out that paperwork for that, or you just had some of your advisors to help you with it? No, I <laughs> I did that on my own. Oh, wow. Uh, in fact, I do it for others now. At the time that I filled out my application for the 501c3, mm-hmm. it was a recommendation of my attorney, and he said, well, Gene, you can – you know, you can go to the IRS office and pick up an application. And I went to pick a booklet, and it looked like the booklet was the size of a telephone directory. <laughs> but, I, um, but, see, that's where your education comes in. Sure. And, uh, you know, sometimes, Tim, we can, be, we can become mentally unemployed. And that's the reason why I don't allow any of our staff to give out any kind of advice. Because if you will lay out lines of suggestions, people will say, oh, I knew that. Why didn't I think of it? It's because you they were mentally unemployed. So sometimes we have to get our people mentally employed again. Mm-hmm. So I, I started thinking about, hey, so I did these things in school. All I have to do is just read and understand. So, And I've got the wisdom. I asked God for the wisdom. 
the knowledge and the understanding, so all I had to do is put it together, and it went through the first time. It was no cost then, but now it costs uh, $750. Uh, the Winans came here. Mary and Norman Winans came here, and I put the Winans Music Ministry together. So, in fact, she just called me. She'll be back here in June in order to uh, assist her in writing some proposals for the wine and ministry. So it spreads abroad. It spreads wow. abroad. And you guys also appear, I think, your youth group appeared on Bobby Jones. Bobby, yes. We've had Voices of Hope for, let me see, Princess is now 29, so we've been with Bobby Jones for 28 years. Wow. So you go to the, every year, you, you take your group youth group out to, to do the broadcast on BET? Uh, well, we don't. Since the last year, within the last year, we've had four of our individuals that have deceased, and they're talking about now they want to do a uh, Voices of Hope reunion. So we're getting ready for that. Um, and then we'll have um, Dr. Jones here. Birdie Gales comes in, which is Bobby Jones' assistant. Of course, you know she's with Jill. But um, she comes in, and she is the host for our, our Discovery of a Star and Andre Montel of Amir Omega Record Company in Miami, Miami Lakes, Florida, comes in and he awards a contract, a recording contract to those individuals. Wow. So um, we music and um, we have our community service workers. They are mandated by the courts to come in, and we have youth and adults um, that come in and do community service. So not only because they come in just to do the work to pay back to the community, but we have a counseling with them, and they work to learn what they can do in life besides get in trouble and wow. be involved with it. That's awesome. I guess in, in closing, as we wrap everything up, and to talk about any closing comments that you'd like to add towards about your organization itself. Well, I just I would like to say that I you know I would like to see Hope Incorporated spread it throughout the U.S. Because, you know, God has done such a great work here that I would like but so anyone that would like to make contact with me, if you have my contact information, they can call in or if they have questions, they can call me. Okay. I'll be happy to email them information or or talk with them, you know, if they want to get started in the business, some of the knocks and bumps that is there and they can ride over the rough places. And I just they can just feel free to make contact with me. Any particular things that stand out when you said bumps and bruises on the road? Anything that you could, that stands out that they should look for to try to? Yeah, avoid? one of the main things is be careful who you choose to operate with you. Wow. We had one incident, and it's a good thing that we had uh, Representative Theo Cribs on our board. We had one of our board members. Um, that was on the advisory board, took our information and took it to another organization. That happened to us twice. And um, they got funded, but they were funded and then had to turn and come to us to see how to operate it because they had the information, but they didn't know how to implement it. So that's one of the things you have to be very, very careful. You have to know who you're sharing and working with mm-hmm. because you can put a lot of work into something and then someone can, it's just like, uh, the building of the tower, the advocacy that they were with, they were with them and they were not. So you have to be careful with that because you can work very, very hard to get things together. That's one of the lumps, lumps that you have to be very, very careful with, uh, and that's a hurdle because if you go in the door and try to submit behind them, and you've already had things in place, then that's a hurdle. The other thing is you have to be very, very careful. Of, uh, and we run into this of attitudes. We have to really have people that are. I'm just saying professional. That they don't have to be doctors, lawyers. Whatever. They have to be grassroots individuals that are professional and that can work with one another, or that can tear it down before it gets. Wow, wow that's something else. That's some really good advice. I, I guess if you say at the very end, how would you like to be remembered in your your ministry and your mission? And is there a song? that speaks to you as a whole? Uh, well, being a writer, <laughs> and I have <laughs> some songs I have written, um, is I give my life to thee, and I will always follow thee. And that's when I look up to see what God has. In Matthew it says, we will always have poor. 
And when we look at that, we say, you know, if you're with clo- without clothing, mm-hmm. we can clothe you. If you have food, we feed you. If you're in jail, we go and visit you. So Matthew is one wow. of the basic that we need to look at, that we based our mission on. And I think that I would encourage individuals to read that. When he says that I was in prison and you didn't visit me, I was hungry and you didn't feed me, we are doing all of those things under hope, helping our people economically. And I would say take Matthew and just follow Matthew and you will be successful, but you got to put him first. you got to put God first. And you've got to be earnest about what you're doing. And if you talk about going and helping people, it's not about money. It's not about money. All those things will eventually come to you if you have a sincere heart. Wow. Before we close the program about your contact information, I'm not sure you have your mission statement I was looking at. Do you have it in front of you or close to nearby? Um, Sorry. That's okay. No problem. Because I think it's a powerful mission statement to nearly close the program with, but we're also going to talk about your contact information and how they can contact you. Yes. Yes. Um, the information is to stimulate citizens, corporations, businesses, individuals in addressing the needs of indigent, challenged persons, particularly those of low income, abused children, chronic homeless, disadvantaged, providing decent, safe, and affordable housing, assisting in preparation for educational, nutritional, and employment opportunities for young adults and citizens as a whole. Wow. How can they contact you if they do have some questions about your organization? My telephone number is 316-618-8652. And my email address is Carter Hope Inc. three one six at AOL dot com. Okay. And just repeat that again as the telephone number again? Three one six six one eight eight six five two. Great. Dr. Jean Carter, I really appreciate you coming on to the program. You have really blessed us for these forty five minutes and gave us wealth of information. And I appreciate you just coming on to the program and sharing your story. Uh, thank you so much, and, and uh, please allow your listeners to know that I appreciate them taking their time out, and I think this is a beautiful station. I think the core business show should go further than just there. Thank you. I really appreciate it. But again, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Tim. God bless you. Continue to do well. Thank you. Well, have a great day. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and same to you. Take care. Take care. Again, this has been another show, uh, The Core Business Show, with Tim Jacquet. Thank you for listening to the program. The show can be downloaded on iTunes or on Blog Talk Radio, or you can go to our site at Apple Capital Group. Thank you for listening to the show. Tonight we have Minister Edwin Hawkins, or Mr. Old Happy Day himself. So take a look at that, listen to this show. It is 9 p.m. Central Time tonight or 10 p.m. Eastern, 8 Mountain, and 7 Pacific Coast. Again, thank you for listening to the program, and have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.